Ladies and uh, gentlemen, it's eight o'clock. Let's start. Good morning and welcome to Civita Breakfast here at La Fable. As we are live streaming this event on Civita platforms, let me also wish our viewers online a very warm welcome and good morning. My name is Erik Lecke, I'm a fellow here at Civita, and I will be this morning's host. Today's topic is uh, US midterm, a term commonly used on the elections of Congress in between presidential elections. There's a saying in the US, ABC, always be campaigning. There seems always to be an election in the, in the United States. And the midterms will be held on Tuesday, November 8th, where all 435 US House seats and 34 of the 100 Senate seats are on the ballot. What will be the outcome? And will the result impact Biden's foreign policy? Generally, and Europe in particular. How about Ukraine? What are the longer trends in US foreign policy? Speaker today is Kenneth Braithwaite, adjunct professor at Høgskolen Christiania, former ambassador to Norway, and the 70th, 77th US Secretary of the Navy. In just a few seconds, I will end my introduction, but before I give the floor to Mr. Braithwaite, let me provide you with a few practical details. Mr. Braithwaite will have a 10-minute uh, opening speech, whereafter I will have a few questions of my own before we open up for interventions from the audience. If you want to register on the speakers list, please give me a sign and I will recognize you accordingly. Please introduce yourself upon taking the floor and speak into the microphone, which a Civita colleague will provide. <clears throat> I need to emphasize, as always, that we are opening up for questions or short comments, not additional speeches, so be brief. <laughs> This meeting will finish no later than nine o'clock, and I kindly ask you to stay seated until then, unless it's absolutely necessary to leave prior to the end of the meeting. My final point, we urge you to share your thoughts on social media. There are some US politicians who like to do that, and you also have the opportunity, of course, and the Twitter hashtag for this meeting is Civita Focust. But please remember to turn your mobile on silent mode. Well, so much for the practicalities. I'm honored to give the floor to you, Mr. Ken Braithwaite. Tell us, how will the US midterm go? <laughs> well, if I had a crystal ball, maybe I would know. <laughs> the 35th President of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, gave a speech, Loyola University, fall of 1958. That speech, he said, let us not seek the Republican answer, or the Democratic answer, but the right answer. Let us not seek to fix blame on those who served in the past. Let us accept our responsibility for the future. He gave that speech nearly 100 years after Abraham Lincoln talked about a house divided could not stand. History, ladies and gentlemen, has a great way of giving us vectors into the future. Yet we fail to recognize those lessons. We commit ourselves to making the same mistakes over and over again. Let me pose a question to you. An aggressor nation annexes a former territory that now belongs to another sovereign nation, and the world is surprised. The same aggressor nation then invades a neighboring sovereign nation, and the world is shocked. Meanwhile, 7,000 kilometers to the east, another aggressor nation quietly builds the largest navy in the world. Is it 1938 or is it 2022? I would argue both. The world is under immense challenges, both domestically in my country, which is what I'm sure you want to ask me about this morning, 
But I believe there are grander challenges for us around the globe. We have clearly entered into a new era of great power competition. I believe Russia seeks relevancy. History and culture go together. I spent a lot of time before I came to Norway studying your culture. So I had an understanding, an idea of what Norway was all about. Few of us take the time to think about that. China wants to be dominant. China poses the greatest threat to the Western world for the United States since the War of 1812. When I give this speech in America, people ask me, Ambassador, that's pretty obscure, the War of 1812. We don't even really teach it in our history books anymore. But the War of 1812 in America was our second war of independence. And we were fighting the greatest nation on the face of the earth, Great Britain. The only reason that we were able to survive that conflict was because, like the Ukrainians, the Americans fought with passion. But more importantly, England was fighting a bigger war against a guy named Napoleon on the continent of Europe. So America got a pass. And for the last time in our history, we were up against a nation that could have affected our way of life. Today, we find ourselves in a similar position. The world is at a crossroads, ladies and gentlemen. You have a great slogan here in Norway of never again. Never again would you allow your freedoms and your liberties to be taken from you. Yet, like those of us in America, we fail to think about what history teaches us and what that means for the future. I won't get into the decisions of the body across the street from us, but I believe that a storm is coming on the horizon. And I believe that storm will culminate in a requirement for all of us to be closer than we have ever been. It is one of the reasons why I've dedicated my life to the transatlantic relationships. Our allies are more important to America than they have ever been. Yet many Americans don't understand that. We're an isolationist state. We have two big bodies of water that protect us from the rest of the world. So we sadly focus on domestic issues, issues that have divided my nation, issues that have been exploited by both our politicians and our media to create a advantage to them for the short term. But the disadvantage to the United States of America and all nations that look to democracy and rule of law as the norm. The 26th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, a navalist as I am, said, in the history of mankind, many republics have risen, have flourished for a less or greater time, and then have fallen because their citizens lost the power of governing themselves and governing their state. I believe in the resiliency of democracy. I believe in the resiliency of my nation. But I'm afraid that in the short term, we are in for some very challenging times. And short of a crisis that can bring us back together towards a common purpose, I'm afraid that we're going to continue down this road 
for a little while. So what lies ahead in these elections? I believe at the end of the day, as difficult as it may appear, the American people will make the right choices. They will elect the right leaders. And we will look to democracy as the way of life that has always governed us. I've been asked many questions about the events of January 6th, and I can tell you that most Americans did not worry on that day because, again, as the great Winston Churchill said, right, Americans will, after they've done everything else, will eventually get it right. <laughs> So I'm happy to take your questions. <laughs> th th thank you, Ken. Uh, you touched upon it uh, in your introduction now about the situation in, in, in the US. And I mean, many people are talking about the situation for the US democracy, uh, tense polarization, and also the fact that many of the Republican candidates simply do not recognize the 2020 uh, election as legitimate. What's your take on, on the situation in, in, in the Republican Party? Uh, and do you agree that the US uh, democracy is in a crisis? No, I, I don't believe we're in the crisis that everybody thinks we are. Um, the United States has always been based on a peaceful transition of power. I just finished a fantastic book about George Washington. I think there were fewer greater Americans that walked the face of this earth than George Washington. Washington had the ability to declare himself a monarch if he wanted to. He was that beloved in the nation. But he knew that to create this new experiment of American democracy, that he had to place the interests of the state above himself. When I was 18 years old, I raised my hand to take an oath of office. The oath was not to any one person. The oath was to the Constitution of the United States of America. The reason for that is because our forefathers established that principle, that all of us who serve our country serve the people. We do not serve a monarch. We do not serve an individual. The majority of Americans believe in that. On January 6th, what you saw was the emotion of a nation. People who were exploited for that emotion to act in an unprecedented way. I was the Secretary of the Navy that day, and I was in the Pentagon across the Potomac. And my colleague, the Secretary of the Army, and I were all that stood between the President of the United States and the mobilization of the Army and the Marine Corps. He and I both knew that we took an oath to uphold the law of America. And as we discussed it, he said to me, Admiral, don't you guys in the Navy call that mutiny? I said, well, perhaps it is. But either we leave here today if we are ordered to mobilize forces and we decide to disregard that order, or we leave as patriots. I did not fear for democracy on January 20th. What I feared was a nation thousands of miles away who would have taken that opportunity and the transition of power from one administration to another to act in an aggressive way that would have triggered a national emergency in the United States, a mobilization of our armed forces, and then a sitting president who would have attempted to vacate 
the inauguration and created a constitutional crisis throughout our land. That is what I was most fearful of. The media is partly to blame. What you see is sensational. It goes back to the beginning of mankind. Humans like to watch other humans in distress. Think about the Romans and the Christians and the lions in the arena. When I first traveled to the Middle East in the late 1980s, I was appalled that the television shows that were on Al Jazeera TV were the Jerry Springer show <laughs> and other shows about America divisiveness and people yelling at each other, exploiting family difficulties and differences so that the people in the Middle East saw the culture of America much different than the real America. I can tell you, my wife and I don't yell like that in our <laughs> home. The media has to sell or has to garner their part with a market space. It's one of the things that I enjoyed while I was here in Norway because your journalists have not been affected by that yet. But in an America that I grew up in, there was CBS, NBC, ABC, and that was about it. And then a guy named Ted Turner came along in 1977 and created CNN. And that opened up the aperture to report more news, less important news. Then the internet comes along, and there are all types of mediums by which we receive our information. And therefore, the market pressure on those major networks made them rethink their approach to the market because, again, they need to garner enough of an audience to be relevant and to be profitable. So today, what you see in America is very divisive journalism that those who believe in one way tune into that political channel that's what it's become, and those on the other side tune into the other side. And then politicians come along and they exploit that. Instead of like John F. Kennedy talking about bringing us all back together, they just double down and try to ensure that whatever percentage of the electorate that they can appeal to is the ones that they look to to support them. I will assure you that if you came to America, that America is not coming apart at the seams. We've had many difficult periods of time in our history. I lived through the 60s and early 70s when the protests in my country were even louder and more violent than they are today. So do I believe there's a problem in America? Yes. I do. Do I believe that America can be greater than it is today? Yes, I do. I took my, I won't say my life, but I gave my first speech at a political fundraiser shortly after leaving as Secretary of the Navy. And after many speakers got up before me and rattled everybody's cage and rallied them like Donald Trump would do, I said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, to make America great again is to not to just don, to put on a red baseball cap that says, make America great again. To make America great again is to get back to the principles of our democracy, those that our forefathers created, the art of compromise, of working together across political divide. And then I ask, how many of you are married? Do you get everything in the relationship with your spouse? Probably not. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson once said that no man, should have added women, should get everything that they want. His greatest political rival was a guy named John Adams, his predecessor as president but his best personal friend was John Adams. Because in the art of the debate, 
they found a way to educate each other and to become better human beings. Senator Marco Rubio asked me before I came here to Norway if, he th if I thought I could learn anything from the Norwegians. <laughs> I said, Senator, I learn things from my 14-year-old son every day, so I'm sure I'll learn a lot from the Norwegians. Your form of government across the street proves a better form of democracy in coalition government because that government, in order to rule, is forced to compromise. Sadly, what you see in my form of government is a sine curve where we get into these cyclic patterns of the American electorate being dissatisfied because they think that, well, we'll try that, and that doesn't work, and we'll try this. And this is the yo-yo that goes back and forth. So for me to stand up here and to predict what's going to happen in 2022 or 2024, would be a fool's errand. I have some thoughts. <laughs> I love to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a very moderate Republican. Um, I think that came across during my service here. I think it's probably one of the other reasons why. Not only my background in the Arctic is a former Navy pilot who used to hunt Soviet and then Russian submarines, but my politics is a little bit less than to the far right. I'm an ardent defender of democracy, as I hope has come across here today, and I believe that comes with a strong defense. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, without a strong defense, we lose the ability to protect our interests. Not far from here, December of 1953, George Marshall, famous general, second Secretary of Defense in the history of the U.S., and then Secretary of State, the architect of the Marshall Plan, received the Nobel Peace Prize. Afterwards, he was asked by an often posted reporter, General, how do we ensure victory? Because during his speech, he had talked about the challenges of nuclear warfare and how important our alliance is. If I read you the quote, he might as well stand out here and give this same speech today. He answered the reporter, the only way that we assure victory in World War III is to not fight a World War III, is to use our deterrent strength, now remember NATO's brand new at this point, as a transatlantic alliance to stand up against those aggressor nations that would seek to change our way of life. Things haven't changed. If we thought we defeated communism when the wall came down, we were sorely mistaken. Communism, or so in iteration thereof, is alive and well, and not too far from the border of Norway. I'd love to ask this question, if I may. Hmm. How many people know who Xi Jinping's father was? <laughs> I've got this really cool coin, if you can tell me who he was. Who said yes? Uh, I did. Yes, ma'am. Uh, did I get any reward? You tell, me who he, you tell me who he is, or who he was, and what he did, I will be happy to give you the coin of the U.S. ambassador. Okay, so actually, I'm not from China, I'm from Taiwan. Okay. Two seconds, ma'am. Just take the mic. Western media, but I, I cannot say 100% accuracy, but uh, Xi Jinping's father, I think he was a close uh, armored with uh, um, Mao Zedong back in the, uh, when Mao Zedong was uh, uh, having his revolution. And he was uh, very, um, uh, he was just very much a core uh, supporter of Mao's uh, ideology, which actually leads to many, many analysts uh, trying to figure out uh, Xi Jinping that uh, he could uh, follow his father's steps like this and that. But actually, he turned out very differently, very artistically, very artful in his politics in order to um, 
uh, pull through all this long journey that he has come all the way up on here. Even now he's a super powerful man. You can see just uh, finished the 20th Congress, but actually he has meandering the way from very, very many dangers that he was highly uh, super skillful so that he could pull himself out up until here. <laughs> Do I get the prize? Of course you did. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> <clears throat> the lessons of history. Ji Shou was one of Mao's closest lieutenants. He helped Mao defeat Chiang Kai-shek in the KMT, forcing the nationalists to the island of Taiwan. How influential was your father to you? <laughs> Sir? My father was in the very first wave at Normandy on June 6th. He was in the third landing craft to touch the sand that morning. Two landing crafts behind Brigadier General Teddy Roosevelt, Jr. My dad was shot in the head. Thankfully, you survived her. I probably wouldn't be standing here today. I'm very proud of my father. Xi Jinping is very proud of his father. But Xi Jinping also read Sun Tzu and the Art of War. That celebrates deception and deceit in being able to achieve your objectives quietly and humbly. I would argue that Xi Jinping is an ardent Maoist communist. And having accepted the baton from Deng Xiaoping and the other Chinese leaders, and during that 20th Party Congress, we just saw what he did to one of those previous leaders, he is reversing, not the direction of China, but the national intent of China. If Russia seeks to be relevant on the world stage, China seeks to be dominant. History, ladies and gentlemen, teaches us a lot. But again, my other hero, Winston Churchill, those who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. He banged on the back bench of parliament during the 1930s and said, Britain needs to rearm today. There is a storm coming. And people dismissed him as a loudmouth, as a warmonger, as a hawk. The future's in front of us. And there are a lot of indicators to give us an idea of where it's heading. And when I talk to groups, afterwards they tell me, geez, Mr. Secretary, that's a real Debbie Downer. <laughs> it is. I worked for General Mattis, great guy, another one of my mentors and heroes. He came here to visit me when I was ambassador. You all were upset because President Trump met with Vladimir Putin in Helsinki. Jim told me, he said, hey, Ken, what's that old adage? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. <laughs> so get out there and tell the Norwegian people why the president met with Vladimir Putin. When we put up barriers and we fail to seek engagement, we create <coughs> cold wars, of which Jim was very concerned we were slipping into a second one. But my favorite story that General Mattis told us when I was a young Navy captain was that humanity can be broken down into three different buckets or three different identities. There are the sheep, which the majority of us are. There are the wolves, which thankfully there are few of. And then there are the sheep dogs. The sheep like to put their head down, eat the sweet grass, and let the warm sun bake on their back. Pretty good way to live life. The sheep don't like to look up to the edge of the forest and to see the wolf. Because the wolf, ladies and gentlemen, is always there. The wolf waits 
for the opportunity to take the weakest sheep, or depending on how many sheepdogs, the entire flock. Then there's the sheepdogs. Sheep don't like the sheepdogs. Do you know why? Because the sheepdogs look like the wolves. And they remind the sheep that there's a wolf over there. Why else would the sheepdog be there? But the sheepdog is ready to sacrifice themselves to protect every sheep in the flock. And as General Mattis told us that morning, we are the sheepdogs. It's a job we train to do every day, and we pray to the Almighty we never have to perform but you need the sheepdogs. And in times of peace, we don't like to invest in sheepdogs. But I'm telling you, we better start thinking that through because the wolves are out there and they're investing in more wolves. I had a front row seat as the Secretary of the Navy. It's the other thing I like to tell Republican audiences back home. The enemy of the Republican Party is not the Democratic Party. I'm tired of seeing that on the media. The strongest word in the title of my country is United States of America. I fought in Beirut, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And I'm damn sure that some of the men and women along my side were Democrats. In fact, my command senior chief, I'm pretty sure, was a Democrat. But you know, we never talked about politics. We talked about surviving. We talked about protecting the interests of America. Difference of opinion is good. It creates strength. I, I will uh, shortly open up for interventions from, from the audience, but uh, talking about uh, wolves, uh, a question from me, uh, Ken, about the situation in Ukraine which obviously has the attention of the world. I, I recently saw uh, 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 an article in Washington Post from Kevin McCarthy, the leader of the Republicans in, in the Repre House of Representatives, saying that uh, the, if the GOP takes the House, they might not give blank checks to continue the support to Ukraine. And now I also saw 30 Democrats signing this letter to Biden saying that they should seek negotiations with uh, the wolf, sorry, Mr. Putin. And, and uh, there seems to be some kind of isolationist... Uh, isolationist, uh, isolationist, yeah. Isolationist, thank you. Uh, on, on both sides here, are you worried that the uh, uh, U.S. might not back Ukraine? And, and what implications does the future U.S. foreign policy has for Europe and Ukraine? It's a great question. So... We see this in my culture in America a lot. Americans become apathetic to long-term engagements. You saw this during COVID. Americans got to a point where we were done with COVID. Even though we weren't, <laughs> the public felt that we didn't want to deal with that anymore. That's my fear in what you're seeing in Congress. This is a minority. And remember, Eric, there is a House of Representatives and there is a U.S. Senate. And this is the other thing that I've tried to reassure Norwegians when I was here as ambassador. The President of the United States cannot unilaterally take action generally on most major policy issues. For instance, he rattled his saber about the relevancy of NATO. Yet, I am a devout NATOist. I teach at NATO. I just taught there last month. And the decision was not his to leave NATO. We have checks and balances in our form of government that our founding fathers created for just that purpose, to protect the interest, to slow the process down. But yet, Donald Trump came from the private sector, never held public office before, didn't understand that he wasn't running the Trump organization and it wasn't a lineal command and control decision of his. And that is part of what you all saw 
play out again, exploited by the media to show you how terrible things are in America. It's not perfect. As I said, we have a lot of challenges, probably more today than we have uh, in my lifetime. Um, America will do the right thing in Ukraine. I, uh, I'm not fearful of that. But I would argue that the answer to Ukraine lies, as in most things, a diplomatic solution. You know, Nikita Khrushchev put missiles in Cuba in 1962, not because he wanted to threaten the United States, but because he thought outside the box, very smart guy, how do I get a negotiating chit in my favor to be able to get the Americans to get those missiles out of Turkey? I'll appeal to the communists in the Caribbean, Fidel Castro, who doesn't like the Americans either. I'll put some missiles there. That'll make Fidel feel more powerful, and that'll give me a bargaining chip when I push Kennedy into the corner. We need to be thinking diplomatically outside the box as to how we solve the problem in Eastern Europe. And we have to do it soon. Ukrainian people are suffering, as we all know, while we sit here. And, and you know, being a military guy, it frustrates me when I see all these Ukrainian flags throughout my country. And it's like... What are we really doing to help them? But yet, being a person who focuses on world strategy, geopolitically, it would be extremely difficult for the United States to lead a military coalition into Ukraine, and my God, then we'd create World War III. And it, so that's why diplomacy has to win out in the Ukrainian conflict. It has to. And I would argue that America has to seek a partner to be able to begin those negotiations. And it has to be a partner that the Russians can look to as a perceived ally, as the Ukrainians look to us in the West as a perceived ally. But we're missing our opportunity to step up to the responsibility that the world is looking to America to provide. Mm. I have noticed the one gentleman sitting behind there coming on the speaker's list. Can I get a uh, cup of water? Or? Yeah, sure. He took my water away from me, Eric. Oh, you know, I thought I you... Like, you know, I guess I have to perform <laughs> in order to have... Your yeah, time. you get a microphone. And I also mentioned... For, you get a microphone shortly. And I also want to, uh, to urge uh, also other people to come on the speaker's list. I noticed uh, also Eric and uh, other people if they want to. <laughs> Thanks, shipmate. Sorry. That's okay. No, no, no. What did I stop? Did I oh. Didn't, Does it work? Okay. Yeah. yeah uh, my name is uh, Lutz Bachmann, a German citizen living for 22 years in uh, Norway. And before I went to Norway, I was living and working in the U.S. Thank you very much for your comparisons to history, especially to 38 and uh, today's uh, situation. You also mentioned uh, Churchill in the 30s and his fears of the situation. But you did not mention that in 38, Britain uh, wanted to negotiate. Now you said we have to negotiate. Mm -hmm. uh, Britain and the idea to negotiate and uh, to calm down Hitler was a historical error. It was. In the end, the Allies, and as a German citizen, I'm very happy that the Allies decided we have to go to Berlin to finish this. Should we today go to Moscow? Is America ready to do that? Should we, what is even more on the horizon, is America, especially after the uh, upcoming midterms, more ready to stand for Taiwan, which is uh, probably the next threat on the horizon? And uh, a lot of other questions, but I will stop here. Thank you for... <laughs> they are kind of big questions, so... Uh, uh... Yeah, I'd like to hear your short version, Ken. Short? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you noticed I'm not short-winded, Eric? Uh, um, it's a very complex question and a very great question, so thank you, sir. Um, what happens when you trap an animal in the corner? What happens when you push something? What happens if somebody were to push you and you felt that your very life was at stake? What would you do? The difference between 1938 and 
and 2022 is one word, two words, <laughs> nuclear weapons. That makes it extremely problematic. And remember, history, understanding someone for who they are is very important. We seem to have lost that lesson as well with Vladimir Putin, who's a former KGB agent, who has very droidly divided power within the Russian government so that he has complete command and control, separating oligarchs from the military and creating a firewall. I would argue, are we fearful that Vladimir Putin would seek to be aggressive in another place? Would he come into Norway, for instance, if he were really like Hitler, looking to dominate all of Europe? I look into a crystal ball on this one. My gut has told me all along that Vladimir Putin has been motivated to reclaim the relevancy, as I mentioned earlier, of Russia but to also create a buffer between himself and the West. My dad taught me to understand the perspectives of another is to put themselves as best you can in their position, in their moccasins, as we say in America. That's what our Native Americans used to wear on their feet. Putin sees NATO differently than we do in the West. He's fearful of NATO. I would argue that if he were given any indication that Ukraine would have never joined NATO. He wouldn't have invaded Ukraine. NATO has expanded, has gotten twice as big since 1991. I think we're 30, soon to be 32 and counting. Russian culture is one of pride, but it's also one of skepticism. I went to Russia for the first time when the wall came down because I wanted to see what the Russian people were all about. And that skepticism comes from having been invaded over and over and over again. So I believe the answer lies in a negotiation, including assurances from NATO. NATO's relevant, probably more today than it's ever been. And as I talk about the alliance and the importance of the alliance, the security of Western Europe is very important. But NATO has to begin to believe or think beyond just the defense of Western Europe and its relevancy to protect democracy on the world stage. It's a big order. I'm fearful that if Vladimir Putin felt that he had few options, that we would find ourselves involved in Holocaust. And I don't think that's anything that any of us want to see happen. I have also noticed Paul uh, sitting there, uh, a lady sitting here, and also I think Rick behind there. Uh, there mm -hmm. are, we are going to end to nine o'clock, so if there's anybody else wanting to come on the speaker's list, they better rather sooner than later. Please, Paul. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, fascinating to listen to you. Uh, in Norway, we have a television program called UXA. USA? UXA, oh, UXA, which I would encourage you to see because it is indeed influencing our view on America today. One of the issues that this journalist brings up, and I'd like to hear your comments on that, is the flaw in the way that the states enacts or changes the electorate map called gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. And to bring us back to the election coming up, uh, would you comment on to what extent this is a, um, how to say, an undemocratic way to steer the election results? Yes. I'm going to go back to a question that Eric asked that I didn't get a chance to answer because, like a squirrel with a nut, my mind went off that way. <laughs> the one thing that Republicans overestimated and I saw this. I was asked to run for the U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania when I left the secretary's office. Um, was the impact, the reversal of Roe v. Wade. 
it shifted the political dynamic across the nation <clears throat> overnight. And the Republicans lost a lot of ground because the majority of Americans were comfortable with the right to choice. Therefore, I think to answer your question, because I know you really want me to tell you what I think is going to happen yeah. in November, I think the Republicans are going to be less successful. If you were to ask me to look into that crystal ball that I don't have, I think we are hard-pressed to capture the Senate. I agree with Mitch McConnell. I, I don't think we have the best candidates in a lot of the races. Um, and I'd also say that on the House side, um, that uh, we have, the Republicans have the chance to take back the House, um, but it'll be a lot slimmer margin um, than, uh, than will be thought. And if you know, all 435 the House of Representatives are up every two years. So the whole body, everybody's running for re-election here in November. The Senate, it's one-third. It's a six-year term. So that's why I think the dynamic will play out um, the way that, uh, that, it, that it is. Gerrymandering has become a problem because in using the system for political benefit, <laughs> again, instead of accepting the, the precedent of our forefathers, if you looked at my state of Pennsylvania, it's hilarious to see that there's this chunk of a district here and then this tiny little line that goes up and comes over and if I'm on one side of the street, the family lives across the street might have a different member of the House of Representatives. It's that convoluted. That is not right. We need to accept that majority rules. If we don't like that, then we probably should go live in some other country. <laughs> Our country has an electoral college. That is extremely important. That was created by, if you haven't figured this out, I'm a constitutionalist. I believe in the Constitution. I believe it's a beautiful document. It's a living document. And it can be amended and changed, but it is very hard to do that. And it provides us um, with those vectors, as I've maybe piled, those vectors that we need to follow. Um, the Electoral College balances things out between the larger states, because we're a representative nation of the people, by the people, for the people, but it gives the smaller states a little more say in how we elect the President of the United States. It's why you've seen several times in our history where the, most, the, the candidate who received the most popular vote did not become the President of the United States. 2000, George W. Bush, most recently, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. It's the system that has survived. It's the system we need to uphold. And thankfully, our judicial branch, branch which generally stays apart you know, from the political process, generally, um, has really gone after gerrymandering in my state. There are many Republicans, colleagues of mine, who are upset about that because it's affected the overall balance. But it got to the point where there wasn't even any minority representation in a lot of places because the gerrymandering had become such that the other party just totally dominated the entire body. That's not right. Mm -hmm. Next question. The lady sitting here had it. Did I answer your question? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and I also noticed, uh, Rick, I haven't noticed anybody else, and we're uh, approaching 9 o'clock, so, so if you want to come okay, to speak, sister, I'll, I'll be very quick. Yeah. Actually, my name is Irene. I, I, I am a formal diplomat from Taiwan. I have two uh, short questions to Mr. Ambassador, because I caught one, one sentence that you said regarding this Ukrainian uh, situation, that when U.S. and the West ally, they uh, sit together talking over all these things, the more actor you involve, of course, the more moral support you have, but also less efficiency on decision-making. While the longer it takes, you can see that that how the suffer for not only Ukrainian people on their land, but also the world is uh, getting involved with all this inflation and everything. But I caught your, your saying, you say, you think the solution should be diplomatic, diplomatically, uh, but thinking outside the box. So I would like to see how your take on this, if you have any, um, how you think about what that actually, if you can elaborate. And second question is that regarding Taiwan and uh, versus chi China, 
Um, actually, if there ever is a war trigger, that would be far more dangerous for the world than the war in Ukraine. But uh, President Biden has uh, three times openly said he gave a verbal guarantee that he will protect Taiwan. He will, U.S. will uh, send troops, or where the military support will always be there, dead guaranteed for Taiwan. But and then very quickly is reversed by either um, Blinken or other uh, spokesperson. So what <laughs> you're an expert be with your diplomatic and security Don't expertise. An expert. <laughs> so how do you think about that? And uh, how, how real truthful the, um, the support or the determination on US uh, um, military um, guarantee, so code on code on this, uh, because everybody's talking about that. It could be very dangerous when they, when they ever really come true. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. A great and big uh, question, Ken. Again, the short, short answer. And it seems to me that it's very unclear what the US policy in Taiwan actually is, and that's dangerous. Yeah, those are big questions. That's going to take more than uh, a couple minutes. Um, Ukraine. <clears throat> it's probably not. A resolution that a lot of people would celebrate, especially the Ukrainian people who are fighting with immense passion. My fear is when Putin gets to a point where he's had enough, he's going to turn the entire nation of Russia on Ukraine. And for the same reason that Taiwan could not stand up against all of the People's Republic of China. Ukraine cannot stand up against that type of onslaught, no matter how much we send support to the Ukrainians. Going back to my point on pride, Vladimir Putin then cannot lose. Russians are proud people. How many times have I said that? They have a long history. And Vladimir Putin has expended too much in treasure and, more importantly, in talent. Too many Russian soldiers have died. He's got to come back home, and he's got to declare some type of victory. So is that the assurances from the West that Ukraine will never be part of NATO? Maybe that is. Is it understanding Russia's legitimacy to the Crimean Peninsula? After all, Nikita Khrushchev gave Crimea to the Ukrainians in the mid-1950s as a gift, never thinking that the Warsaw Pact would ever fall apart. There's a reason why Vladimir Putin has done what he's done. It's not right. He shouldn't be appeased. But we have to deal with him in a way that protects the interests not only of Ukraine and its sovereignty, because if I were President Zelensky, I would be thinking about that long and hard. In the long term, what's the best for the majority of Ukrainians? As a naval officer, we're taught if the ship is torpedoed and is at risk of sinking, we may have seconds to decide on how we save the ship, which could mean closing off watertight spaces and committing some of our shipmates to their death. But that's the responsibility to protect the majority. Hmm. Taiwan is even more complicated. The United States has assured Taiwan of its defense since its inception. China, of course, has challenged the world on that, and there are many nations that have walked back their diplomatic recognition of the Republic of China as being a sovereign nation. I do believe that it is only a matter of days, weeks, months, or years, shorter than we think. My classmate from Annapolis 
is Admiral Chris, Chris Aquilino. He was the commander of our U.S. Navy Pacific Fleet. I nominated him to be the new Indo-PACOM commander. That's the military officer in charge of all U.S. and allied forces from the Arctic and the Pacific all the way around to the Northern Arabian Sea. Chris tells me it's going to happen sooner, a lot sooner than we think. And are we prepared? I said earlier, China has been a land-centric nation focused on its army since its inception. It has the largest army in the world, 3.5 million people in uniform. But eight years ago, Xi Jinping, I'm pretty sure, read a book called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. It talks to the fact that every great nation in the world has been a maritime nation. China pivoted to the sea and started a naval building program second to none. Today, as I stand before you, the United States Navy is not the largest Navy in the world. We have 286 warships in dropping. We just announced a decommissioning of 15 more ships the other day. China has 371 ships and is building. In the last six months, they built 14 ships to our one. And why do you build such a navy if you don't seek to have influence around the globe? Hmm. Norway saw this up close and personal in 2010 when China challenged you on the Nobel Peace Prize recipient. And they've since done some other very overt things when it comes to freedom of speech and other liberties that we too often take for granted. I'm not sure what's going to happen in the Western Pacific. Either way, the United States and the rest of the free world loses. We have, uh, it's three minutes, to, to three minutes to nine, and Rick is the final question down there, behind. Just uh, show yourself, Rick, and you get the microphone, and it will also be your final comment scan after Rick has his question. Please. Good to see you again, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Secretary. Good to um, see you, shipmate. As a former uh, Pennsylvania resident, uh, I think they could have used you as a Senate <laughs> uh, candidate. Uh, just a uh, more of a, a response to a comment here. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, I took the opportunity and did some traveling and uh, fought the barriers uh, to, to do that traveling. And uh, uh, two places was Africa and the Philippines. And uh, as former military, I understand the, the, the need to have the, the big stick when you, when you need it. Uh, but in Africa especially, I noticed that the Chinese were heavily involved in economic development, mm -hmm. uh, specifically port development, also mining and all kinds of other interests down there, and, and the same in the Philippines. Uh, and, it, and my big takeaway from this was, where are the Americans? You know, I, I thought, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities going on here. There's development. 20 there's seconds, Rick. And uh, so anyway, your comment on the engagement that seems to be a little bit lacking on the economic side uh, versus the military. Yeah. Yes, so going back to the art of war in Sun Tzu, right, what he advised uh, leaders to think about was not necessarily military force or military co coercion, although you must have a large military to back up um, your national will, um, but is economic coercion. And what we see is the Chinese using those economic, those economic initiatives and endeavors to create um, the strings to be able to then have the economic coercion, to be able to force those nations to do what they would like them to do. Um, and we talked about this last night at a dinner. The United States, sadly, 
and unfortunately, fail to recognize the implications of not being involved in Africa or South America. We felt that a paper called the Monroe Doctrine would keep everybody out of South America. Meanwhile, if I took you to Chile or Argentina, you see that the Chinese have greatly influenced things there. The Panama Canal, oh, well, that's owned by China. Um, in Africa, um, after the Cold War, we pulled back on our USAID, that's our State Department arm that seeks to support um, developing third world nations. We pulled all that funding back to cash in on a peace dividend because we didn't need to worry about the expansion of communism anymore. There wasn't any more communists. Um, those were huge mistakes. And I'm not sure that we have the economic capability today to come back and do the things that the Chinese have outmaneuvered us on. Um, the Chinese, if you study their culture, they play a long game. They think many years in the future. They don't think about the immediate. They don't think about their own lifetime. They think about their children and their children's children's lifetime and what planting the tree today will bear fruit decades or centuries from now. It's admirable. Before we end, uh, let me just uh, say that uh, if you're interested in further Civita events, please visit our uh, webpage, civita.no. Thank you so much, Ken, for sharing your insights. It's been a great uh, breakfast. Well, uh, I would be remiss, Eric. I know everyone wants to go, and you're welcome to jump up and leave, but I just wanted to thank you for asking me to come here. I wanted to let the Norwegian people know how wonderful it is for me to be back here. Uh, Norway's become like a second home. The foreign minister mentioned to me the night she met me before I came here um, that uh, she thought I'd do okay here. <laughs> she said, I think the Norwegians are going to like you, but I think you're going to really like Norway. And I think for the rest of your life, you will have an association and a friendship with our nation. And I feel that. Um, and so it is so nice to be back here. And sadly, my wife is extremely upset with me because she's not here with me because I think she even loves Norway, Norway more than I do. So uh, thank you for welcoming us and making us feel a part of such a great place as Norway. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Great catch. Thank you. A bottle of wine, a short token of our appreciation. Okay.